So when you look at pictures in National Geographic magazine, what do you see? Well, you see exotic locations, don't you? Far away land. But you know what you really see? You see people, you see animals, you see life. That's right, it's not enough to go to a faraway place. You must add some spice to it. People, animals, whatever. That's what we're gonna talk about right now. Talk about how to do group portraits, how to do individual portraits, if it's people or it's animals. You know what, the techniques are basically the same, aren't they? So we're gonna talk about how to make really memorable pictures with your friends and family above all else. That's what I really enjoy doing. It gives you a sense of time and place. So let's get started. So I'm on the beach, it's more the middle of the day, it's very sunny out. I always wear a long sleeve shirt and I wear a big sun hat when I'm out in the sun in the middle of the day. I just do, I don't wanna get burned and I don't wanna put sunscreen all over my face, it gets on my camera. But what can you do on the beach? You can do near far perspective is what you can do. There's no better place than the beach, it's wide open, there's no distractions at all. So we can really make pictures sing in terms of foreground all the way to the background. We can make everything in focus or very little in focus. It's all good. All right, so have a group of friends here. This is the standard way that a lot of people would shoot, shoot their family members or their friends. Line them up like a picket fence. There they stand. Almost like a firing squad, isn't it? I can make that a little bit more interesting by getting low. I think we can really make it interesting by actually moving people around and not being afraid to pull somebody out, bring them to the foreground, make other people stand in the background and rotate it around so people don't get their feelings hurt. So that's a very good way of getting really interesting pictures of people that you see every day, friends and family. So Bridget, come on up, come on up right there. Let's see, you guys go in the background. How about right here, right here? And all you guys gotta do is hang out and talk. Hang out and talk and relax and act natural, okay? All right, first picture we're gonna do is just this. It won't be a pose thing, it's just gonna be people hanging out. How about if we have a hand up there, you have a nice ring, that's pretty good. Kind of look off that away, and see what we get. Very nice, very nice. It's everybody look right at me for one, look right at me. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Very nice. Move in a little bit, Lynn, good. Guys, scoot that way a little bit. Kelsey, you're good right there. There we go. Kelsey, scoot in that way. Everybody smile big. And let's do hands on hips for one. All right, good. All right. We got a nice variety there. It's really not very difficult to do. We can swap people out. We can bring other people to the foreground other people to the background, rotate. And you know, it's a starting point. It's just a starting point. You never know where it'll lead you, but near far perspective is a really good way of making portraits that are actually interesting rather than just lining everybody up. It's actually as simple as that, you guys. So let's say you're on vacation. This is the day you're here. It's the middle of the day. The light's very harsh. What do you do? Have no fear, you can, tame, no, you can tame light no matter how harsh it is. Middle of the day, no problem. I just use a fill flash and a little soft box. It's no big deal. I'll dial down the ambient light, I'll underexpose the beach, and then I'll shoot with my flash and brighten the subject up. I like to shade the subject because I don't want my flash to compete with the sun. So we're underneath a beach umbrella. We'll try a few. Perfect, looks good. That's nice, I mean it looks really good actually. Perfect, it looks studio lit and you're in the middle of the worst part of the day, high noon. So that's all, that's all there is to it really. Dial down the house lights, underexpose the beach, fill flash, use a little bit of flash to kick in some light on a shaded subject. It really, really looks professional and very easy to do. I know you guys often don't have a choice about when to be out, you're taking your vacation, you're in the middle of the beach, middle of the sunny day, this is absolutely the way to use this. It's the way to defeat very, very harsh light. Remember, there are, no, there are no excuses for shooting poorly. You have to be able to handle any visual challenge that's thrown your way. 
so now we're inside in the beach house and we're facing a very common problem. What's that problem? Well, we want to get a good picture of these guys sitting around having a good time, but we want to show where we are. If we try to just shoot a simple exposure like that up against windows showing that we're at the beach, it's terrible. Everything outside is just blasting away white hot. This will not do. So how do we compensate for that? Well, we could try to crop the windows out or we could wait till another time of day when the light outside is around dusk. Light outside is so dim that our room lights, our reading lamps, literally balance out. That only lasts for 10 minutes or so in the evening and in the morning as well. Truly the only way to overcome this type of a situation where the outside world is five or six stops brighter than in here, a stop is the hole in the lens, remember, is to use this. Fill flash, that's the key. So how do we do it? We put it on and my flash is set to full power because it needs to be. It's a small thing, it's trying to compete with the light of the sun outside. I'm gonna reset my camera. I'm gonna change the settings on my camera to handle this. We're gonna slightly underexpose outside and away we go. That looks pretty good. I'm gonna extend this little bounce card, We're bouncing off the ceiling a little bit here. That looks excellent, it really does. You know, another thing that I like to do sometimes, I'll literally bounce off clothing. Now, so Kelsey's got this little glow because my shirt is gold. She's got this gold kind of firelight on her from this. There's a million ways you can use this, but it is a really vital tool. Notice how I've got it off the camera too. I don't have it bolted on, direct flash like that. It's amateur hour. Flash ruins pictures if you don't do it right. So get the flash off the camera. You can do it with a cord like I do. It's more fail safe for me anyway. Uh, or you can use wireless flash, easy as can be. And you just experiment and you move it around and you'll get great pictures. But think about this, fill flash is a great way of showing an indoor scene, show the world outside, make it all balance out. You know, it's not just the places we go, it's the faces we encounter, isn't it? That's what I'm looking for wherever I am, whether I'm abroad or at home. I'm looking for really interesting people in the places that I visit. For example, in the Pantanal of Brazil, man, you can't beat these guys, companheiros, the cowboys of the Brazilian Pantanal. Beautiful, subtle light, interesting characters, nice guys. Or in, in another part of Brazil, street kids, taking a break from soccer with a little bit of flash thrown in. Could be one of my guides in Bolivia holding up a caiman that he caught by hand, very proud of that. You know, that's interesting. It's a fairly okay picture in terms of background and light. The light's soft, the background isn't as good as it could be in terms of cleanliness, but it's interesting. He's holding up a caiman. This is interesting too. Very blue color palette here, but you know, the lady's got a muskox head in front of her head. That's really weird. It's interesting, it works, it works. Now you don't have to see faces. It could just be people out in an aloe patch or a guy holding hot peppers that they use to make, to make pepper sauce down in Louisiana. That's okay too. You can see the years of work on his hands and the colors are really vibrant. We don't even have to see any part of a person. Really, it could be some weird game at a children's museum where kids press their hands and their faces into a backdrop. Or it could be something that speaks less of fun and more of isolation. This is my father in Amsterdam. He'd never been out of the country before. He's a little frightened actually. And it's one of isolation this picture is. So that's okay too. I use silhouettes a lot. They isolate, they, they're mysterious. They speak to something that I can't even explain really, but they're beautiful. And they really do elevate photography in a way. They make pictures become iconic, don't they? A good silhouette does. Fog's great for that. You know, another thing that's good to do, sleeping pictures. Could be a couple in a hammock or a dog at a friend's house, wherever you go visit. You know, sometimes you just see a perfect corner in a room, perfectly lit, it's waiting for a portrait. It's a stage, a chair can be a stage waiting for a player to appear. A lot of times when we go on vacation, we take to the water, don't we? We go to, we go to the swimming pool, okay. It's, it's fine to do this type of thing, but let's up the ante. How about the surf at the end of the day? That's fine. How about if we get wild on a raft down a river? Take a waterproof camera, of course, and slow shutter. That's great. It, it takes a lot of failure, by the way. I shot a ton of pictures to get this one image. I got about one that turned out. We could go underwater at a local pool, 
or we could get something very quiet that, that's got nothing showy to it at all. It's just a couple with a little private moment, an intimate moment. Little intimate moments are something that I really try to work on. No matter where I'm traveling, you know what, people are all the same basically. In a very basic way we all seek those connections, whether it's in New York or just, just at a brunch at a friend's house. That's what I'm looking for. Of course in soft light with a background that doesn't kill me. Gotta have a background that really doesn't fight the foreground. I'm constantly looking for that wherever I am. All the time on the lookout for, for framing devices, time of day, and above all, something weird or interesting like a girl as part of a sand sculpture on a beach. Or it could be a market scene. Or it could be Carnival down in Rio. Sure, this is lively and visually loaded, but you know what? That's okay. I love shooting in ducks in a barrel situations where the picture taking is really, really easy. That's great because so many times the answer is no and the question is, should I take a picture now? Better make it interesting. Truly, truly, make it interesting, please. That's what I wanna see. Now granted, I get to travel more than the average person. I've been all over the world, all seven continents, all that jazz, but you know what? The connections, that's what I'm looking for. I shoot the same way if I'm in Australia as I do back home. That's really what I'd advise you to do. No matter where you go, take these same techniques with you and work every tool in your toolbox, both mentally and whatever's in your camera bag. So let's go back out in the field. So we're at the beach still and we're looking around and I wanna do a portrait because portraits are nice and it's fine to have people engaged with the camera and looking directly. It doesn't all have to be candid. Portraits are a very legitimate way of shooting. So we have some very big dogs and some very kindly owners and we're gonna to try to do a nice portrait or two and just see where that leads us. The standard thing here is, is Eileen. She's looking very stoic. The dogs look very nice. And I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use that big building in the background. It's kind of a big busy building, but it's got sections that are clean and I can make Eileen pop right out. The light's very soft and nice. She looks very stoic. That looks kind of nice. It's straightforward, but you know, it's a nice portrait of her at this time in her life with these dogs and she'll always cherish it, I imagine, because we get older by the minute, don't we? And, and here they are and they all look great. But let's add another layer. Let's talk about layering. I do that all the time. Jim, come on in. Maybe just go up to the ridge top. Jim's got a nice bright red shirt on. I'm gonna stop you right there, right where that blue is. He really stands out well against the blue. And I'm gonna move just a hair. Actually, I'm gonna move you over a little bit. Perfect, look at that. Okay. So now we've got a very nice layered picture. And the dog's up. Jim, will that dog go up again? Yes, right here, very nice. Love it, love it. Look at how big that dog is. I'm gonna go in tight. That is awesome. That's beautiful, look at that. I love it. I love it. So we started out with this very loose picture. Let me shoot again. We started out with this very loose picture, just kind of a standard thing. And then we've got him in a really colorful shirt. He's against great primary colors behind him. The red of his shirt goes with the green and the blue. And then the dog gets up on him and completes it and makes it look fantastic. And the dog even gets a little treat. So we go from something that's pretty ordinary, just putting the pieces together, to something that's actually quite fun. And that is a big dog and that is interesting. And the light's soft and the colors are great. Mission accomplished. I've shot this scene with a wide angle lens. I've got Jim over there with this big South African Mastiff dog. And he stands out well, even small, because he's in a red shirt and he's against a blue wall. But I have a secret weapon. Look at this. It is a Nikon 200 to 400 millimeter telephoto lens. Now, why would I use a telephoto lens if I could just walk right up to him close? Why would you do that? Well, because when you zoom in with a telephoto lens, you make the background go away. It just becomes a soft palette of color. It's a great way of cleaning up the chaos of life. Are you ready, Jim? All right, here we go. So, that is an amazingly big dog. Huge. It's about as big as he is. Great, thank you. Great, so what this lens does, you zoom in, you could be at 200, 300, 400. The closer you get to the subject, the softer the backdrop will, will go. And this just made that shingle-sided structure just melt into a solid, nice palette of blue. So it's perfect. You can use this for cleaning up, getting rid of power lines or railings 
or buildings in their entirety, the closer you get, the more out of focus things will be with this and your subject will be nice and sharp. I use this on wildlife constantly, but it's a great thing for using in the suburbs or in urban areas too. Don't forget, if you can take this, if you can carry it, use it, it's a great tool. I'd like to talk for a moment about long lens use when doing portraits of people or animals or just capturing the sense mood in a place. For example, these chickens on a farm in Illinois. Well, that'll work, right? Why not? That's kind of, it's not a super long lens, but it's long enough to kind of compress distance against a soybean field. How about this? A little bit longer lens, maybe a 300 here, maybe a 400 with Denali, the big mountain in the background with a friend of mine in the foreground. That's okay. Or a 600, really zooming in on a seal in Antarctica. These are all examples of how to, how to use varying lengths of, on a long lens to really make something pop out. I think about using long lenses once in a while. They're very heavy, uh, but mainly with wildlife. I use them on wildlife quite a bit. I prefer not all, to carry not, not too much weight when I'm traveling around. You know, a 600 millimeter lens, it weighs 14 or 15 pounds, and you need a tripod. I really like a 200 to 400. I can put it up just like these. And I like the shot after the bird leaves the limb as much as the bird on the limb. The one on the limb is kind of pedestrian, really. You know, I use a long lens for portraits once in a while as well. I don't do it very often. You know, the older I get, the less weight I want to carry. And if I want to travel light, let's say I'm on vacation, maybe I don't want to carry a 600. But I will carry a smaller lens. I use a 28 to 300 all the time now. And that really helps clean up life's distractions and the chaos in the backgrounds. If I'm on assignment, I take basically every lens I, I own. Sometimes I photograph things like this. If I really want to make a point of seeing those endangered tortoises that are going to be eaten for dinner that night, and I'm in a cluttered jungle setting, I'll use a long lens, really pop them out really well. Soft, subtle light, that's the way to go. And then back to the standard wildlife pictures you'd see in National Geographic, long lens, something interesting, subtle light, beautiful exotic looking animals. But you know, you don't have to have the $10,000 lens. A good picture could happen at lunch, truly. You could be sitting at lunch, just watch what happens in front of you. Some of the tourist destinations in Central Africa, there's birds everywhere around the, around the outdoor cafes. If you sit and you're patient, you can make something that's actually more interesting than if you'd shot it with a ginormous lens. How about that? Let's go to Uganda for a little bit and we'll look at lion trackers and lens choice here. Lens choice, that's kind of key. Maybe you want to show the lions that sleep up in the trees there. They're very famous for that. So you start back, show the overall scene, you get in a little closer, kind of a medium lens. Same here, a medium lens, but it's eye level. And if the cat gets down in the grass, that grass is very distracting. You're gonna need a long lens to really pull them out, really be able to see them. That's the beautiful thing about a long lens. For me, a 600 millimeter lens, a 500, even a 400, it's not necessarily about zooming in as it is about cleaning up. I think that's something most people don't consider, they don't think about. Last place I wanna take you to in this is Gorongosa National Park. It's quite a place, it's in Mozambique. I was assigned to do a story there. Let's look at the lens choices here. Let's talk about how we get people into these scenes. Obviously when a helicopter's landing, that's pretty dramatic, but so are fires and charcoal selling actually. That's really hammering the country's forests. I went there at the invitation of a man named Greg Carr. Here you can see him real clearly, can't you? Even though it's kind of a chaotic scene, middle of the day, why can you see him? Well, it pops out against that blue sky. I got down low, but not too low. He's not sticking up into the trees. He's perfectly backgrounded there against blue skies. He makes a welcome speech. I look for anything I can in these places to try to make interesting frames, especially about the hope of reforesting that area. A lot of biologists are working there. They do beautiful work. Look at a macro lens. That's a good choice. It's kind of a telephoto in miniature, isn't it? I do portraits of the kids there that are out collecting for a, for a famous bio blitz they had there with Dr. E.O. Wilson as the host. Great guy, late light, medium lens choice, maybe a little bit longer lens choice, maybe a macro again, and then the last shot of the day. How about that, just in the hotel room. You know what, lens choice is really critical wherever you go, it always is, it always is. What tool in your tool bag are you gonna to use to communicate with? That's what I want you to start thinking about. Take a wide variety and then choose wisely which lens for which shot. So now we're at a campground. Beautiful forest. We're with friends, Mark and Kate here. 
But you know what? It's kind of boring, actually. If you're out with your family or friends camping, what are you going to make pictures of? It's, it's trees and you're just kind of sitting around. And what are you going to do to really elevate it and go beyond the obvious pictures and make it interesting? What can you do? Well, Mark was getting ready to cover the tent with this big orange backdrop. He flapped it a couple times. I saw the sun catch it. Isn't that nice? It really is neat, but it doesn't last long enough and I want to craft this. And you know, they're my friends. I can do that. It's okay. So go ahead and hold that up. Let's see how that catches the light. Very nice. Very neat. Perfect, perfect. The sun's hitting it great. I'm going to raise my camera up to get the hot sky out of there and shoot down a little bit more. That looks great. Okay, try spinning around. Let's see how you look as a silhouette. Silhouettes are really a nice way of making the common very mysterious because you don't know who's behind there, what's going on, why are you doing it. That is really... Yeah, I love it. That's nice. That's very nice. But Kate is sitting in there laughing, so you can, <laughs> you can get out there and try it too, okay? Hop on out, and we'll put both of you behind there. Since you're a couple, that makes more sense anyway. So let's see how this looks. Very nice. Okay. How is that back there? Weird? All right. Yeah, see, this is great. I love it. Kate, come a little bit more forward to me. Perfect, perfect, perfect. There, good, good, good. Good. I love it. Okay, at ease, at ease, thank you. So, you know, I started out with this tent scene, kind of a nothing thing. We have Mark, we added them both, and then I came in even tighter, so we don't even know we're in a camping scene anymore. It's just this big wall of orange with two silhouetted people back there. It's kind of weird. It's interesting, that's the whole thing. There's no right or wrong. It doesn't need to be typical, you guys. That's what I'm telling you. It needs to be atypical, it needs to be different. And that's something that you can do just with standard tent gear. How easy is that? If it's translucent and it can allow a little sun through, that's all you need. So we're in the woods. Let's say we're in a city park, anywhere where there's nature, and we're out with our family and we wanna do a portrait of everybody. What are we gonna do? We're gonna just line them up like a picket fence all stiff? I don't think so. This is about doing pictures well, crafting pictures, really making them interesting. What do we do? What do we do? Well, how about a family tree? Just like this. Look, trees are everywhere. They're all around us. Find one with some low branches. Hopefully your family can climb a little bit, a couple feet off the ground. They're wearing colorful clothing that makes them stand out. And the light is soft. Very, very important. Without soft light, they wouldn't read it. It would be a mess. With soft light, these colors just really resonate and everybody stands out. This is also about layering. Look, we have Mark and Kate up front and then we have Nancy and Grace and we have everybody kind of layered on back and I have a lot of depth of field here. I'm actually, even though it's daytime, I'm shooting this at 2500 ISO. Why? I want a lot of depth of field to really show everyone sharply. I could also go with a shallow depth of field and very low ISO if I just wanted one person to be sharp. But in this case, I want everybody sharp. And it's as simple as that. I'm gonna walk up. Notice I'm not on a tripod. It's very freeing to be able to move around. That way I can cut out anybody I don't particularly like. Let's see, right there. It's very, 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 very easy. It's kind of clever. And you know what? It works very, very well. There's nothing to it. But I have put time in on this. I spent about an hour walking around the woods here, making sure that this is a tree that people could get into, nice low branches, making sure that the time of day is gonna be about right. We're shooting this towards sunset, soft light, that's it. It took a little thought, it's not difficult, just a little bit of thought to take your pictures from okay to really excellent. All right, so the end of the day, it's perfect. Nice, nice, nice soft light. This is our chance to see firelight right at dusk. At our campground, Mark and Kate are cooking marshmallows. Doesn't get any better than this. Just a little bitty, bit of a window here, maybe 20 minutes or so when fire matches the low ambient light that, that we have in the forest. So I'm gonna do a few shots like this. And actually, the glow off the fire is enough. I don't have to show the fire. I can just show the glow off the fire and really make something nice here. Back up, kind of did my overall scene. 
Now what I wanna try is getting down low and getting into the flames and do a time exposure on a tripod and really see what we can do with those flames and movement. Time exposures using the tripod and a cable release. Nothing's gonna touch the camera that way. Nice and clear of it. Now we're really slowing the shutter down, maybe a second, two second exposure at F22. That's gonna allow those flames to build and really look almost like orange water. They're flowing out of the pit. Well, these guys are staying still, they're not moving, they're nice and sharp. Just this time of the day and at dawn, that's the only time you can do this type of a picture. Use a tripod, it's worth it. You'll really be able to build the fire. It'll just look lovely. Only still photography freezes time like this. It's a lovely, lovely effect. So now you know all about how to do wonderful pictures of groups, right? Okay, let's try to do something that goes way beyond our third grade portrait in school where they lined us up like a picket fence or a firing line. I want you to do this for your assignment. Take a group of six people or more if you're adventurous and I want you to do near far. I want you to do something that's really interesting. Remember near far perspective on the beach? That's right. Do something in an open area where you're actually composing something that has some depth and is interesting. That's the deal. You know, most of all, if you have fun with it, they will too. Give it a try. Almost like a firing squad, isn't it? I can make that a little bit more interesting by getting low. I think we can really make it interesting by actually moving people around and not being afraid to pull somebody out, bring them to the foreground, make other people stand in the background and rotate it around so people don't get their feelings hurt. So that's a very good way of getting really interesting pictures of people that you see every day, friends and family. So Bridget, come on up. So when you look at pictures in National Geographic magazine, what do you see? Well, you see exotic locations, don't you? Far away land. But you know what you really see? You see people, you see animals, you see life. That's right, it's not enough to go to a far away place. You must add some spice to it. People, animals, whatever. Come on up right there. Let's see, you guys go in the background. How about right here, right here? And all you guys gotta do is hang out and talk. Hang out and talk and relax and act natural, okay? All right, first picture we're gonna do is just this. It won't be a pose thing, it's just gonna be people hanging out. How about if we have a hand up there, you have a nice ring, that's pretty good. Kind of look off that away, Let's see what we get. Very nice, I just do, I don't wanna get burned and I don't wanna put sunscreen all over my face and get some on my camera. And what can you do on the beach? You can do near far perspective is what you can do. There's no better place than the beach. It's wide open, there's no distractions at all. So we can really make pictures sing in terms of foreground all the way to the background. We can make everything in focus or very little in focus. It's all good. All right, so have a group of friends here. This is the standard way that a lot of people would shoot, shoot their family members or their friends. Line them up like a picket fence, there they stand. Ever, that's what we're gonna talk about right now. Talk about how to do group portraits how to do individual portraits, if it's people or it's animals. You know what, the techniques are basically the same, aren't they? So we're gonna talk about how to make really memorable pictures with your friends and family above all else. That's what I really enjoy doing. It gives you a sense of time and place. So let's get started. So I'm on the beach, it's more the middle of the day, it's very sunny out. I always wear a long sleeve shirt and I wear a big sun hat when I'm out in the sun in the middle of the day. 